This is a very interesting section of scripture as Jesus tells this story about an unjust manager, an unjust a steward, and he shows us a bad example to teach us what we're actually supposed to do. And sometimes that's a great lesson, isn't it? He takes the, some attributes out of this unjust steward and says, I actually want you to apply this to areas of finances, to areas of faithfulness. And so I, I think that this section of scripture is just absolutely fascinating fascinating. Jesus gets to our hearts and says that we've got to have one master. We can't serve God and money. It's going to be one or the other. Verse one, he also said to his disciples, always important to know who Jesus is speaking to. It helps us with interpreting the passage. He's speaking to his disciples. Remember last week, Luke chapter 15 with the prodigal son, Jesus was directing that towards the scribes and the Pharisees. So, so this is a teaching to Christ's followers. It is interesting, by the time we get through the text, we'll see there's a few Pharisees that began to listen as well. There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So this man is so wealthy that he's able to hire someone to look over his affairs, to look over his house, look over his ranch, his farm, his goods, his business, and the steward's running everything. He's, he's the manager and gets news that his manager is actually wasting the goods, is squandering the goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship. For you can no longer be a steward. He loses his job. He loses his position because of his unfaithfulness. In verse 3, Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. This weight of realizing that he's losing his job. What in the world am I going to do? He's saying, I can't dig. I'm not going to do manual labor. He says, I'm not going to beg. I'm too proud to beg. He's thinking and scrambling, how am I going to provide for my needs? Maybe you've been through that stress of losing your job unexpectedly, getting laid off or even getting fired. Pack up your stuff. Today's your, your last day. So here's his plan for survival. I've resolved what to do. That when, I'm, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. His plan involves making friends. If I make some friends, I'm not going to be homeless. There's going to be those that are going to welcome me into their house. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. His master has loaned money, loaned resources out to, to people, it says, I want you to then let me know how much you owe. And the first one owes a hundred measures of oil. This is 875 gallons, roughly, of oil, 3,200 liters, lots of oil. So he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. That's quite the savings, isn't it? Debt cut in half. Imagine Visa called you on your credit card. We're feeling benevolent. We want you to cut you a deal. Not lying, not compromising your integrity, but being wise with money, taking your present position and securing our e eternal future. And Jesus clears this up in the next verse. And I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon. Mammon's another word for money or wealth that when you fail they may receive you into an everlasting home. Walvard and Zuck puts it this way in the Bible Knowledge Commentary, use material things for future spiritual benefit. Kent Hughes, what is an inex inescapably clear here is that our wealth and possessions are to be used to win eternal friends. This unjust steward, here he was wise in order to have temporal friends, and we're to take money and unrighteous money in the sense that money is not holy in and of itself. It's not evil in and of itself either. It's, it's a tool. But use money, use resources in order to secure 
an eternal impact. Now, it's interesting how the world, unbelievers, can be shrewd with money for the purpose of monetary gain. And Jesus is saying, I want you as disciples to be shrewd with money, not necessarily for earthly gain, but for eternal impact. It reminds me of what Jesus said, is to be innocent as doves, but to be as wise as a serpent. Well, what does it mean to be wise as a serpent? What does it mean to to be shrewd? And a lot of times for us as believers, we look at the physical, material world as being unspiritual, saying, I really don't want to enter into that. And Jesus is saying, no, enter into it. And he's going to challenge us to, to be wise with finances and then to use those finances to invest in the kingdom to see eternal impact. Maybe there was someone in your life that invested physical resources that impacted you spiritually. And you go, wow, that, that was such a blessing. I, I'm on a receiving end of that. Pablo sharing about the impact that has taken place with people adopting light shine kids in that Taramara community. They're on the receiving end of that. Someone invested $30 a month and I got to know Christ as my savior and my life has been impacted and, and changed. And that's what Jesus is encouraging us. Hey, be shrewd with money. Actually, even be more shrewd than those that don't know Christ as their savior, not for the purpose of greed, but for the purpose of investing in the kingdom. Verse 10, he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. We're going to tackle some excuses for unfaithfulness. We, we've got excuses for unfaithfulness. Are you ready? The first is this. It's too little. It's too little. I really don't have to be faithful or just in this because it's just too little. This is a dead-end job. It's not going anywhere. No one's paying attention. No one really cares if I'm doing 110% or I'm doing 20%. It has no purpose. It has no meaning. It's too little. I'm not going to be faithful in it. It's just 20 bucks. What does it matter? 20 bucks? That's like two bucks. What it used to be, ten, two bucks 10 years ago is 20 bucks today. It's just 20 bucks. Why do I got to worry about 20 bucks? It's 20 minutes. What's the big deal if it's 20 minutes or two hours and I've been surfing on my phone accomplishing absolutely nothing? It's just 20 minutes, right? And Jesus says, no. If you're faithful with the little, you're going to be faithful with much. But if you're unfaithful with little, you're going to be unfaithful with much. Jesus tests our character with giving us opportunities that seem meaningless to us. The same is true in our integrity. If you're just with a little, you're going to be just with a lot. If we choose to walk in integrity in what we would consider to be the little things, we will walk in integrity in the bigger issues as well. There's a lot of examples of this in scripture. We see David being a man who was faithful in the little things. He didn't start off as king. He started off as shepherd. He's the youngest of the brothers, so he was given the job of watching the sheep. I'm sure sometimes maybe washing them, but he was watching them. The reason he was giving this job is because he was the youngest. This is the unesteemed position. But we don't see David despising the day of small things. We see him being faithful as a shepherd, protecting the sheep from predators, using his time to be a worshiper, using his time to become an expert of his craft with his slingshot. So he was ready when it came to Goliath because he had been faithful in the small things. You would think that it would go from Goliath to being king fairly quickly, but that's not the case. Saul had it out for David and he was fleeing in the wilderness. He was wandering in the wilderness and faithful during that period of time. He was faithful in the little things that made him to a place where he was faithful in the greater opportunities. Joseph is an amazing story. Here he is sold as a slave by his brothers. 
taken to Egypt, and here he is serving in Potiphar's house. Talk about a good opportunity for unfaithfulness. I'm a slave. There's no way to move up as a slave. But as a young man, the Lord was with him. He was faithful, and he became in charge of Potiphar's house. But then he gets falsely accused, and he's thrown into prison. Prison definitely seems like a dead-end opportunity, right? Not a lot of opportunities in prison, not in Joseph's mind. He was faithful in prison and was given responsibility in prison, which ultimately led to him being second in command to Pharaoh of all of Egypt. He had world impact. Do you know where that started? That started with Joseph being faithful in little things. Is there something in your life where you've said, oh, it's just too little. This just doesn't matter. God's challenge to us would be, this is the place that faithfulness has grown in our lives. Verse 11, therefore, if you've not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? Another excuse for unfaithfulness is it's just money. It's just money. And for some reason, as believers, it seems like we feel like it's unspiritual to manage money. We don't want to really apply ourselves in this area of money because we don't see it as being spiritual. But our worship should impact every area of our life, including money. D.L. Moody said that he could tell more about a person's spirituality from their checkbook than from their prayer book. (laughs) It's also been said the last thing to be reached in our lives is our wallet. (laughs) Our spending with money, it really reveals our heart. Jesus said that heart will follow treasure. Where you put your treasure, your heart will be also. Where are our priorities? Open up your bank account and look where you spend money. And that will exactly reveal to us what our priorities are. Jesus here gives us a really important truth, saying if we're not faithful with money, then how can God entrust to us the true riches, the deeper things of God? And we go, wait a second, these two things are connected in a way that I didn't understand, that I didn't put together. So God's providing the opportunity to work, providing a paycheck, providing resources. He wants us to then manage those. And if we're faithful in managing money for his glory, then guess what? God can then give us greater understanding of himself. He can entrust to us the true riches and give us opportunities in the kingdom. So what in the world does it mean to be faithful with money from God's perspective? And God gives us an indication in in his word. And, And the first is giving. God does want us to to be a giver. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, God says for each of us to purpose in our own heart what we should give. That means it's between you and the Lord and you pray, Lord, what would you have me to give? This all belongs to you. And then to give hilariously, to give cheerfully, to give in a spirit of joy of, God, thank you so much for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for adopting me as your son and daughter, we're not giving, trying to earn or deserve God's favor, but we're responding to the gospel. We're responding to what he has done in our lives. And we've purposed in our heart, said, oh Lord, I I long to to be able to give. Malachi chapter three talks about the tithe and setting aside that tithe to to the Lord. And God actually says, test me in, in this way. Now I want you to understand God's not broke and he doesn't need your money. We believe that here at at RMC. We've got tithe boxes in the back and you can give online, but we trust that God's gonna be faithful to provide for his church and he's done that. So don't think that somehow God's work's gonna suffer if you don't give, but God wants to free our hearts from greed, doesn't he? I've found that giving in my heart is the most healthy thing because my heart has this tendency to move toward, towards greed. It's God's way of growing kids. So when we think of being faithful with money, we first look at, at giving. And then we look at something called a budget. Oh man, are we talking about this in church? 
did I really come on a Sunday morning at nine to hear about a, a budget? Well, what, what in the world's a budget? You look at income, put down all sources of income that God has provided, and then you put down expenses. What are those expenses? And there's a lot of tools that you can use for this, but I found that a piece of paper and a pencil works really well. Like, like just put it down there. Don't make this, this complicated. But actually, write down all of the expenses, including Disney+, Plus, you know, Amazon Prime, Netflix, all those subscriptions, Spotify. Like, what are all the, where, where is all of this money going? And then see if the two line up. Start to look at the income and the expenses and go, hey, wait a second, the two really aren't lining up. And start to think, okay, what are utilities going to be every month? And utilities are going up. And so set aside a number for utilities and the mortgage and, and rent and, and all of these things. And then as you begin to put together a budget, they say, Lord, give me the help and the strength to then live inside of this budget. Because remember, money is revealing things about my character. I'm making decisions with money. Like, why did I spend this money that I didn't have? Well, was I longing for something that God hasn't provided? Am I maybe feeling lonely or feeling desperate and was thinking that this thing could, could satisfy me? Was it just instant gratification? Did I not really? Well, what was the deeper behavior behind that, that spending? But God would want us to live inside of the, what he has provided for us. So you give, you put together a budget, save up some money, you know, save up a thousand dollars. Things are going to happen. Hot water heaters break, unfortunately. Cars break. You sneeze and you spend $500 at the mechanic these days, Right? So it's like, okay, I'm just living paycheck to paycheck. I, I need to save some, some money. And you pray about it. Say, Lord, would you help me to be disciplined to be able to start to save up some money? And then continue to make decisions along those directions of saying, I'm going to enter into this area of money and try to be faithful with it. This is what I'm discovering in my heart is Money is actually that check engine light to where my heart is at. Just like reading the word, my desire ebbs and flows, and my desire for giving ebbs and flows. I'd love to stand before you this morning and say, I always love to read my Bible, and I always love to give. But both of those are not true. There's times where I absolutely love to read my Bible. I have seasons where it's just absolutely delight. I can't wait to read the word. And then there's other times where in my flesh, I'm discouraged. I don't feel like reading the word and it's discipline. It's discipline that gets me into the, the word of God. And I'm kind of ebbing and flowing at different times in that journey with the word. And it's the same with giving. Sometimes my heart is right and I'm in that place of being a cheerful giver with the tithe. And then there's other times where I'm kind of grumpy about it. Here we go. You know, God wants me to give. This is the way he protects my heart from, from greed. And when my heart gets to that place with, with giving, if I'm paying attention, that's the check engine light. And if I really start to examine where my heart's at, it's not in, in a great place. And so the Lord then provides some conviction and it's usually this conversation with the Lord saying, hey, Eric, I don't need your money. If you're going to be grumpy about it, keep it. You know, I want you to be a, a cheerful giver. But if we can enter into this and be faithful in this area of money, then God can trust to us the true riches. It seems like we tend to err on one of two sides. And one side of this money equation is neglect, saying, oh, I'm not going to enter into managing finances. Oh, the Lord will provide. I'm not going to be responsible and the Lord will provide. Oh, the rapture is going to happen. So I'm not going to be faithful with money. No, that's really not the teaching of, of the rapture, right? So that's one side of it. And then the other side of it is you start to be 
responsible with money and it's easy for our hearts to get to a place where now we're trusting in riches and we're loving money and becoming prideful for of how we manage money. God doesn't want us trusting in riches. He doesn't want us being prideful. So where he'd have us be is in the middle where we're being responsible with money, but we're not loving money and we're trusting him and we're being generous with what God has provided. In verse 12, and if you have not been faithful in what is another's man's, who will give you what is your own? Another excuse for unfaithfulness is it's not mine. It's the rental car approach. You know what I'm saying? You rent a car and you drive it a little differently than you drive your own car. And your spouse or your coworker that's with you on that work trip says, hey, what are you doing? You're like, it's a rental, right? It's a rental. I'm going to push this thing. I'm going to see what this car can do. And we may have this attitude with unfaithfulness. Well, well, it's not mine. I don't own the company. I just, I just work here. So what's the big deal if I'm faithful with this or not? I just rent this house. So what's the big deal if I care for it or not? And Jesus says, hey, it's a big deal. Because if you're not faithful with something that belongs to someone else, then who's going to trust you with something to own it yourself? I think a lot of times in our character, we think there's just going to be this magical shift. Well, if I had a bigger opportunity, then I'd be faithful. God says, no, you need to be faithful where you're at. Well, if I owned my own stuff, then I'd really be faithful. I'm tired of working for the man. I want to own my own company. I'm tired of renting. I want to own. And, And God says, no, be faithful right where you're at, even if it belongs to someone else. And Jesus really gets to the heart of the issue in verse 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Another excuse for unfaithfulness is I can serve two masters. I can serve two masters. I can serve Jesus. I can love Jesus. And I can love money. The two of those can, can go together. And Jesus is challenging the disciples to be faithful with money, to invest in eternal good, but is now warning them saying, don't let money become your master. Isn't money a cruel master? Really serves false advertisement. Money and possessions cannot satisfy. God wants us serving him. Are we serving him? Or are we serving money? Are we trying to serve both? In the Old Testament, Jacob, it's a fascinating story to read in Genesis, the first book of of the Bible. But he ends up marrying two sisters. Bad idea. (laughs) Men don't have two wives. And especially don't marry two sisters. I've never met a lady that wanted two husbands. You know what I'm saying? There's been, I've never met a woman that's like, yeah, I really would like two husbands. They're like, the one I've got is way too much work. Why would I have another? But Jacob's got two wives. And of course, he's going to love one more than the other. And he loves Rachel. And this causes a lot of tension in the marriage. And Jesus is saying, this is how you're wired. This is how he's created us. We're going to have one master. And is God our master or is money the master? Do we make decisions based off of money or do we make decisions based off of I'm serving God? Now remember, in serving God, he is going to have us manage money, but we're not worshiping money. When we go to work, are we really working for the paycheck or are we working under the Lord? We can have a higher calling, can't we? I'm not just trying to earn a paycheck. I'm here to glorify the Lord. I'm here to serve the Lord. I want to do this wholeheartedly unto the Lord. And a benefit out of this is that I get a paycheck. But there's a real heart check here to say, am I serving God or am I serving money? Remember what Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Not money in and of itself, but the love of money. As we fall in love with money, then that leads to doing all kinds of evil. This is where the Pharisees come in in verse 14. 
Now the Pharisees who were lovers of money also heard all of these things and they derided him or railed him. Where did the Pharisees get off track? Originally, they set themselves apart to be closer to God, but over time, they stopped loving God and they started loving money. Their master was money instead of God. When Jesus speaks this, instead of being convicted and turning from the love of money, they get mad at Jesus and start to rail on him. In verse 15, and he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your heart for what's highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Do you think the Pharisees were faithful with managing money? Yes, I think that they were. But what went wrong? Their heart went wrong. So they swung too far over here to the right where they were faithful managers but they had the wrong heart where they're loving money, they're trusting in money instead of loving God and trusting in God. And notice it got them esteem among men. Being lovers of money and being good at managing money got them a lot of attaboys from society. During the time of Jesus, they erred in their thinking and they thought if you had a lot of money, that must mean that you were righteous. If you're righteous, then that resulted in wealth. They were the first teachers of the false doctrine of prosperity, the prosperity teaching. Well, if you love God and you walk in righteousness, then you're going to be blessed with all kinds of of prosperity. So people looked at the Pharisees with this cultural mindset. Well, Well, they must be right with God. They must be highly esteemed because they have a lot of money. But God, knowing their hearts, said, no, this is an abomination to me. This is an abomination to me. Jesus then turns a corner in verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. John the Baptist brings us into the new covenant. Covenant is contract, God's contract with us. Prior to John the Baptist in the Old Testament was the old covenant based on works, based on the law. If you're obedient, you're blessed. If you're disobedient, you're cursed. This was all preparing us for the new covenant in Christ Jesus. John's the forerunner to announce Jesus, bringing us into grace, where now God's contract with us is not based on works. It's based on the finished work of Christ as we believe in Jesus. Then God's blessings flow into our lives. In verse 17, and it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than one tittle of the law to fail. The law still has its place. The law is our schoolmaster to drive us to Christ, to show us our need for a savior. Just like the speed limit reveals that we're speeders, right? Who goes 45 on academy? Speed limit reveals that we're lawbreakers. The law reveals that we're lawbreakers. We won't even talk about powers, okay? It's just a crazy mess out there on on powers. In verse 18, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced from her husband commits adultery. Why would Jesus go into this at this point? He's saying, look, we're free from the law, but that doesn't mean that God hasn't called us to holiness, that his standard of holiness is still in place, the motivation is different. The reason for holiness under the old covenant is I've got to try to earn or deserve God's favor. The reason for holiness for us now in the new covenant is God's grace. I've already received God's favor. I've already received his grace and forgiveness. So I want to respond in living a life for Christ. Because it would be easy to think after verse 16 that, well, because we're freed from the law, it doesn't matter how I live. I can just do whatever I want. And Jesus is saying, yeah, we're freed from the law, but God has still called us into holiness. And this is expressed. One of the illustrations of it is in marriage. And Jesus says, he who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who's divorced from her husband commits adultery. There's two other places in scripture 
where God gives allowance for divorce. I don't ever think it's God's heart. God would long for there to be reconciliation. Sometimes there's not willing hearts. Sexual immorality is a biblical allowance for divorce. God doesn't expect someone to stay in a marriage if their spouse is continuing to be sexually immoral. 1 Corinthians 7 talks about a believer married to an unbeliever. And if that unbeliever flees from the marriage, that you're allowed to let them depart in peace. I know many of you are in a place where you've gone through divorce and it's not what you wanted. It's not what you desired. And your, your spouse walked away from, from the marriage. The point that Jesus is bringing here is, yes, we're freed from the law, but in all areas of our life, God calls us into holiness. So a few applications for us this morning. And the first is, be wise, shrewd for the things of the kingdom. We should actually be more shrewd than the world. Not unjust, not lying, walking in integrity, but be shrewd. If people are shrewd to build earthly kingdoms, how much more should we be shrewd to invest in friends of heaven, to see people impact for eternity, to know Christ as their savior? Be faithful in the little things, including money. This may not sound like a lot of fun, but this afternoon, have a budget meeting, right? Get with your spouse and say, hey, let's dive into this. And let's, let's see how we're doing. You're single, press into that budget meeting. And it actually can start to cause some energy, some positive energy inside of your marriage. Say, hey, let's not fight about this, but let's get on the, the same page together. You know, of all of the things that you can fight about inside of marriage, why fight about money, right? Well, let's figure out how to be able to come together and allow God to do some challenges inside of our character because it's revealing things inside of my character. Be faithful because God wants to entrust true riches to us. And then let's pay attention. Am I serving God or am I serving money? Has money become the priority? Let's be honest. We live in a culture that worships money and possessions and material things. If we're not careful, that's where our heart's going to go. And God's saying, no, I don't want you to go there. I want you to go to this place of serving me. And as you serve me, yes, then you're faithful in money. I don't know about you, but I sure think Jesus is a far greater master than money, don't you? To get our marching orders from Jesus instead of from our pocketbooks. We're going to celebrate communion together. Billy's going to come out and lead us uh, in worship. I'm going to ask that everybody would hold on to the elements. When the elements are passed, you can take one set of cups. The, the bread is in one cup and the juice is, is on top. And, and this is a really special time for us as a church. Because as we celebrate communion together, we're all going to take com communion together at one time. It's the broken body of Jesus and it's the shed blood of Jesus that makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. And this is something that Jesus instituted, that Jesus gave to us, saying, do this in remembrance of me. We can easily forget what the Christian life is all about. And the Christian life is about the broken body of Jesus. He was beaten, he bled for you, the shed blood of his new covenant. And we get to enjoy that and we get to respond and make much of Jesus together this morning. And you may not know Christ as your savior. You maybe haven't come to that place of, of trusting him. And we're so glad that you're here this morning. Jesus is glad that you're here this morning. And maybe you've been coming for, for some time. And hear the words of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I want you to hear this. God's not after your money. He's really not. He's sufficient in and of himself. You know what he's after? He's after your heart. And he gave. He sent his son and he gave his son for you to die for your sins, to die for mine. 
And in order for us to receive salvation, to receive forgiveness, we've got to turn from sin. Turning from sin is acknowledging our sin, having a change of mind about our sin. God, I have sinned before you. And to believe that Jesus is God, that he died for our sins and rose again. And you might be saying, well, why is this so important? Because if we reject Christ over the course of our lifetime, the Bible teaches that we'll be eternally separated from God for eternity. Hell, God doesn't want anything to perish. He wants you to become his child. So I'm going to give you an opportunity right now to respond, to raise your hand before the Lord. I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. But if this makes sense to you and you want to trust Christ as your Savior, as we pray, if you'd raise your hand to cry out to Jesus, Jesus, save me. So let's pray together. Jesus, we invite you right now into this time of remembering you in communion. Jesus, would you communicate your love to hearts? If you'd like to receive Christ your Savior, would you raise your hand and just leave it up? Praise God. See hands in the back. Praise the Lord. Anybody else this morning? Praise the Lord. Awesome. If you'd like to receive Christ just right now, raise your hand. For those that are watching online, Jesus sees you. Raise your hand to the Lord. Pray this with me. Jesus, I believe that you're God, that you died for my sins and rose again. I repent of my sin and receive your grace and forgiveness. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. I invite you to be the Lord of my life. You can put your hands down. Father, we know from your word that you rejoice when each person comes to you. So we rejoice. The angels in heaven rejoice. God, you're so good. The greatest miracle has just taken place. We pray that you would bless those that have trusted you for salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.